My name is Peter King. And just by way of tuning you into that lovely analog stuff, that's what they look like. You can warm your hands on that stuff. It's good. <laughs> yeah, and there's a particular chung if you've ever played a guitar through a valve guitar amp. You'll know what it's like. Yes, you know. Right. So, as I say, I grew up in that kind of environment. We had a, we had a, a party line. You'd pick up the phone. You'd go, you're working. And if nobody said anything back, you could use the phone. Otherwise, the farmer down the road would say, yep, I'm on the phone. If you come back later, we'll, um, we'll have another conversation. And I had a crank handle. There was two cranks and then a short crank and then a long crank. So that's kind of where I came from, and these things are a deep mystery to me. They've really just, um, or up until recently anyway, a, uh, a glorified typewriter. Anyway, so eventually I went to school, and eventually I became interested in biology, and I studied to become a zoologist and an ecologist and uh, one of those ones that operates in the marine environment. So I guess you could call me a marine ecologist. But that led me to the environmental sciences. And so I spent some time working for the university in Auckland, doing things like mapping gecko habitats and all of that sort of stuff and uh, teaching students. We ran a postgraduate course. We were a small group of, um, of academics, and I was the technician. And then we um, eventually grew, and then one of those things happened that normally happens in an academic institution is somebody said, environmental science, we're, we're geography. I think that's us. So I think we'll have that bit. And the biologists went, oh, well, we're marine science, so we'll have the marine science bit. And at that, bit, at that stage, I ran away to sea, and I got deeply into going away to sea, and I kind of loved it, because there's nothing quite like getting 1,500 miles south of South Africa and seeing icebergs and feeling the chill in the air because the ice is not that far away. And you're doing interesting stuff. You're dropping moorings over the side. You're profiling. Um, and so that's kind of what I come, came to love. But of course, I was still working for a university. And um, that still wasn't sitting particularly well with me. So I decided to throw financial prudence to the wind and um, decided that they could pay me a whole lot more for a whole lot less, if the, that makes any sense. which led me to getting involved in some um, quite good um, Arctic work with the, um, with the Alaskans. And um, we would go up and we'd put things through the ice and we would um, put moorings in underneath it and then we'd come back in a couple of years and we'd pick those things up and download the, the records. And basically what we were doing was following, um, following heat as it came up on the... On the uh, Gulf Stream and then through the Denmark Strait and into the Barents Sea and around, and we could track it as it went around the, um, I've got a map of that, there it is. So that's where we were, that's where we were working for a number of years, and we were tracking, as you can see, between M7 and around that shelf break, we were tracking the Atlantic water as it went around. Anyway, so that's just really to give you a flavour of some of the stuff that I've been involved in in terms of oceanography, because it's kind of varied. But it's mostly about the, the physicality, you know, it's the temperature, it's the salinity. Um, and so those were the sorts of things that I set out to measure and, and form pictures of. And this here, anybody who's been on an oceanographic vessel will recognise that. It's standard oceanographic equipment. It's called a CTD and it's festooned with instruments and you can collect water samples, so you can match your water samples with your instrument readings, and you can calibrate them. And so I've done 
more CDD casts than I've had hot dinners. I wouldn't accuse anybody else of that, but I certainly have. And um, what you can do is you can build up a picture. You do transects, basically, and then you join the dots and you interpolate in between. And some of that interpolation is kind of deeply problematic because you're just making up stuff in between. And then you put a spline on it and you make a nice curve and everything's good, maybe. But what you can do, and, and, and this sort of comes back into sort of measuring features. We were looking to define features, I guess, in the, in the environment. And so what I became interested in was how sound propagates through water. And we, with a colleague of mine and I, started working on the change in the speed of sound as you dissolve different stuff in water. So classically, you've got a fresh water bit, and then you've got the dissolved bit. But when you dissolve anything in water, it goes, becomes a non-Newtonian fluid. It becomes like a, a weak gel, so it's, um, it's a little bit bouncy, it's a little, the compressibility changes. And the other thing about it is that depending on the different ratios of the different salts and their hydration shells, that changes how they, the, that water compresses and then changes the, um, the speed of sound. So just to sort of give a little bit of perspective, what you've got here is, um, don't worry about the, the graph so much, it's the, um, the, I'm not sure, is that focused? Can you see the change in the speed of sound between the fresh and the salt water? That, that's just to prove my point, just in case I had anybody doubting me. But what you can do then, even though they're, you know, they're not, um, what's the word? They're not u unique solutions because, you know, different ratios of the same salts can lead to the, can lead to different answers, and and also, vice versa, you can get the same answer for, for different combinations of salts. But what we were doing a couple of years back was um, going on a whistle stop tour down the hydrothermal vents of the. Um, off the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, starting from the Azores and head, ending up in Guadalupe. And I thought, why don't I strap a sound velocity probe to the CDD? Because we were doing um, what, what they call toyos. So when, when you, normally when you do a CDD, you'd stop, you do a profile, you come back up, sail on 25 nautical miles. Here, we'd drop it down and then we'd raise it and lower it as the ship moved slowly forward. And so what that produces is a thing called a toyo. And that is a toyo through a hydrothermal vent plume. It's the, the rainbow vent field. Uh, and this is the plume visualized with um, backscatter. So this is looking at the, the amount of particulates in the water. So what we did after processing the speed of sound um, information, where it, basically we took a reference station outside of that field, we said this is what a normal profile would look like, removed everything else, that the temperature and the pressure that might have influenced it, and basically came up with a sound velocity anomaly. We were able to visualize that, which is the same plume, but visualized using the, the sound velocity profile, or the sound velocity anomaly. And you can see that it gives a whole lot more detail, but we don't quite know what it means because there's compositional anomalies in that that still need to be teased out. Fortunately, it was a geotracers cruise, which means that they were collecting um, all sorts of chemical samples. And, uh, and so the next stage after this, this is where I'm up to, up to at the moment, the next stage is to start associating all the chemical measurements with the different um, with the different sound velocity anomalies, and hopefully we can start to sort of tease out what's going on as this hot water comes out of the hydrothermal vent, things start to precipitate out, the chemistry changes as it advects away from the, from the, um, from the plume. But um, yeah, it, it strikes me, and this is the thing that really struck me more than anything, it's like a haze settling in a valley. 
that makes any sense. You've seen a temperature inversion with people burning their coal fires, and it, it sits underneath that. And I think that a little bit is of that is what's going on here. And you can sort of see, you know, it, things escaping basically, breaking through different layers and checking out. So, so sound velocity, composition. We came up with an equation that could, where you could calculate the the salinity based on the on the speed of sound and the temperature and the pressure, of course. Um, and the nice thing about the speed of sound is that it's sensitive to everything that's dissolved in the water, whereas traditionally you take your your salinity from a conductivity measurement. Now, conductivity, of course, only only measures the stuff that can conduct electricity, and everything else it's completely blind to. And an interesting experiment that I did just at home was I dissolved 35 grams of salt in a litre of water and effectively made 35 practical salinity unit water that I could measure with a conductivity probe. I then dissolved 35 grams of sugar in the same water, and even though the dissolved mass fraction had doubled, my salinity measurement was exactly the same. That's an extreme version, but everything in the photic zone you know, all those plants, what do they do when they photosynthesize? They make sugar. So it's a, you know, in certain situations it can be an important measurement. So speed of sound, I'm really, really interested in it. Anybody wants to talk to me about speed of sound, I'm up for that conversation. Yes, yes, Margarita, you're on. <laughs> but I've got other interests as well. So markers of provenance. You may have heard of otoliths. You may have heard of otolith microchemistry. It's the little bits of, um, of trace elements that get incorporated into the hard parts of animals, and they form permanent records. Now, markers of provenance are sort of at the basis of um, uh, sustainable management of marine resources, for instance. Um, knowing where a fish was caught or how a fish population is connected to another fish population or a bivalve population, that's really important stuff. Where are the nurseries? Where are the parental populations? That sort of connectivity, it's all fundamental to a marker of provenance. And people have been trying to tease this out for ages. So I've been thinking about markers of provenance for many, many years. And decided to do something about it in a highly unofficial way, but started to team up with a, a colleague of mine who's a statistician. She's a Bayesian statistician. And so we're starting to look at coupled models now um, between the land and the catchments and the rainfall and the mobilization of trace elements into the rivers, and then what, how that translates into the, uh, into the relative ratios compared to calcium of the trace elements as a distinctive fingerprint. But you can't interpret that. You can get the fingerprint easy enough. You just grind up the shell, pass it through a mass spec. But if you don't have that other model of mobilization and um, the budget, effectively, of your trace elements through the environment, you just can't um, interpret it in any meaningful way. You can't. These things change over time. There are all sorts of ondogenic and, and um, endogenous sorts of things that are going on in terms of the way that they assimilate um, trace elements both into the body and then put that down, lay that down on hard tissue. So that's kind of where we're at with that. That's a long-term project, markers of provenance. Um, but uh, we think that if we can do it with a bivalve, we can actually translate that bivalve, uh, use it as a sentinel, if you like, for mobile species. Um, now, what else do I want to talk to you about? There's lots, actually, but <laughs> we've got a, couple of, got a couple of days up our sleeve. Um, microplastics. 
I just really mentioned microplastics because it's the word on everybody's lips. Um, and my, one of my most recent projects was to actually design an instrument for measuring microplastics in situ and in, in flow. My, I don't know whether you know this or not, but the, the current way of getting microplastic measurements is to put something through a filter, capture it on a filter, take it back to the lab, carefully elute everything off, try not to contaminate it in every step you've got going, and then um, look at these under something like a FTI, a, sorry, a Fourier transform, uh, infrared spectrometer, or Raman, or, or something along those lines, some kind of spectrometer. That's a long process, and that's um, prone to contamination every step of the way. If we can do it in situ, and without having to collect those um, things on a filter, then we've solved something. We've, we've managed to get um, real-time measurements, and then we can roll that out to uh, find out where all this microplastics are, because we still don't know where 95% to 99% of the plastics that have gone into the ocean where it actually is. The other thing about the current methodology is um, the, the filter sizes are generally larger than 300 microns. And it's becoming more and more obvious that the actual bulk of the material sitting in the water column is less than 300 microns. So we're looking at the half mil, 500 micron, down to, down to zero. And, uh, and trying to characterise that. If you, if you go down that one step, the, the amount of microplastics you've got in your water column goes up by about 100 times. So there's a massive amount, really tiny fractions in the water column. So, yeah, so that's another interest of mine, microplastics. Um, I'm happy to chat at leisure um, with any of you on, on that. Um, we've still got to get it built, but the, the concept's there, and um, we know we know how to build it. It's just a matter of getting the money to build it. Uh, that's step two. Um, now, the other thing that I thought, and I was going to um, bang it in here, but um, I couldn't find an image. So it kind of comes back to what um, telecom... <laughs> Te Pelican, sorry. I've got, I'm just call you telecom. It's kind of like I, I, I started to own it. <laughs> but what you and Sophia are doing with your um, with your artificial ecologies and um, who else was we talking? Robertina, you and um, Nuno, Zuna. Thank you. Sorry, Gino. Gino. I'll get it eventually. Gino. What what you were all talking about, and even you, Francesca. Yeah. Even what you were talking about was that um, I've been working for, with um, digital twins, and we have this thing where we're interested in representing the ocean as a digital twin, as a means for getting people in remote locations who may not necessarily have a direct relationship with the ocean to start to interact with it. And we started doing this in, a, in the framework of, a, um, of virtual reality, but we found that it was becoming a bit of a trap because once people get in there, not only are they sort of isolated from people, but they get captured by the technology. And so listening to some of the things that you guys were saying and other ways of presenting that information, I mean, I was particularly fascinated by what, what you were saying about, because your, your eco ecologies are totally artificial, but it struck me that if we could plug that somehow into actual ecologies, we might start to get something really interesting starting to emerge. But also, what other things do we have that, uh, how to put it, um, what other tools do we have? And this is why I love the, the food concept as another way that people can understand things on a, on a basis where they don't have to have de any detailed technical knowledge 
but they can feel it or they can understand it at a, at a certain level, maybe even a common level. And with those sorts of tools, we can start building the, the relationships that we want for people to start interacting with their environment a little more, even though it might be a little bit remote from them or, you know, just how, how can you get them to start caring about it, basically. So digital twins was another thing that I'm interested in, and I've got a mate in, in Norway dying to hear from you people with all these ideas. He's the guy who builds digital twins. He's built the, the framework, if you like. I'm just providing the input on the marine side. So there you go. That's just a little whistle-stop tour. I just thought I'd get up under um, McKellar's encouragement and just sort of touch on a few topics that are dear to my heart. Um, as I say, we've got all week to talk about these things, so I won't go into too much more detail, but there you have it. <laughs>